So to introduce myself, my name's Anne Kitchener. I'm an advanced clinical practitioner um, in general practice um, and a paramedic prescriber. And I also do a little bit of work for East of England Ambulance Service, looking after some of their clinical education. So now what we're going to be talking about ears, um, and I put up here ears and hearing, but actually um, it's not an ideal description because actually the ears do more than hearing. And we'll be really familiar with the ideas about balance and ears, as well as hearing and ears. And we'll talk about this as we go through. So my plan for this evening is to just give you a little bit of revision around um, ear, ear, ear anatomy. Um, and we'll then link that into some of the pathophysiology, the disease of the ears that crop up. And tonight I'll be mainly showing pictures and talking through um, talking through those pictures. So very little words on screen um, from, from me. So I guess if we just have a think about the concepts of how we describe ears to start with, um, and I just want to introduce some of the language. So we know that medicine is generally a split between a bit of English, a bit of Greek, and a bit of Latin. So the Greek version of the word ear is otto, and we'll be really familiar with um, the, the pretext of otto in terms of otoscopes, as in things that we look in ears. If we think about the study of ears, we talk about otto laryngology, so ears and, ears and throats and ear, nose and throat. And then conversely, the Latin bit um, is this auspice, this oracle um, process. So sometimes we hear this words beginning with that A-U-R, such as an oroscope, and that's another name for an otoscope. So this is used interchangeably as we, as we talk about things, but that language, those um, pre-words, if you like, are commonly used as we, as we talk about the language of, of ears and the language of hearing. So if you think about examining an ear, there's a few different places you can get disease. You can get disease on the outside world, anywhere where air touches, um, you can get disease in that outside bit of the ear. You can get disease that tracks inside the ear, and then you can get disease right inside the body. And we'll talk about each of these disease locations as we progress through. But also I'd like you to think about your language and terminology when you're medically describing elements of disease related to the ear. And the anatomy of the outer ear, so the stuff you can kind of touch with your hands, um, there, there's different parts of that. But if I was to choose my top three, the top three that I commonly describe when I talk about bits of the ear, I talk about the tragus and um, that, that kind of um, bit that, that you can kind of pierce if you like and get pierced into the tragus. Um, I talk about the lobules, the kind of dangly bits of the, the ear, and I talk about the helix, the, the kind of outside bit of the ear. And if I was to describe what I'm seeing, I will commonly document um, if there is any pathology, any disease process that I can see, whether that be erythema or crusting or inflammation to those three parts. So that's the first bit that I want to comment on in terms of my outsideness of the ear is my tragus, my lobule, my, my helix. Now, common pathologies that occur here could be infection of the ear, and um, what we call an otitis externa, and there's an otto word in there again, um, and that itis being the inflammation. So if you've got inflammation, crusting, soreness of the outside, and soreness is a real key symptom, so if you're touching and it's really sore, um, that could be evidence of an outside um, infection. And I guess on the balance of probability, if I was to have an infection on the outside of the ear, that's more likely to be a bacterial infection opposed to a viral infection. But conversely, when we talk about inner ear, it's often the other way around. So we've got this outside opening to the world, which is the ear, and stuff that you'll physically see. Now, I don't need my otoscope or oroscope um, to physically check this part of the ear. This is a naked eye inspection, just to have a look around what, what's going on. 
Now, I know with ears, and I know with ears, I can get stuff localised to the ear. But I also think about the anatomy around the ear. Now, just above the ear, you've got a big artery, the middle meningeal artery, which means that actually the blood supply around that area is really rich, really rich indeed. So should I get systemic unwellness, as in I'm really poorly with it, or if this really progresses, this infection in this area, there is potential that that infection can jump into that bloodstream, okay, or can progress in fairness into that bloodstream. And the risk of meningitis progressing um, is increased. So what's the link between the ear and actually progressing to that real worrisome disease process? And actually it's the bit behind the ear, that mastoid um, process. So if you kind of tap behind the ear, you can kind of hear that. Now that bone is really thin. Um, if I was to hold a pen torch behind it, I could probably see some illumination. It's kind of that, that thin. And actually you can get infection of the ear progressing to behind the ear, what we call a mastoiditis. So a, an infection of that, that bone there. So I would always not only look at my outside ear, my tragus, my lobule, my helix, I would kind of give the ears a wiggle forward and look behind the ear. Is there any evidence of bruising, erythema, redness, or tenderness behind that ear? Thinking about, could that be a progressive um, infection, which is actually going to make my patient really poorly? So I guess if I was talking red flags, things that worry me, that posterior ear presentation um, behind the ear on that bone is one of the things that really worries me and would um, cause me to admit a patient because they're likely to have um, a, progressive, um, a progressive infection. Now, actually, I say that, but all the ones that I've ever seen, they've got this presentation, look toxic. They look really poorly and actually are generally clinically unwell. So it is a rare presentation, but it is one that we need, we need to spot. So what I'm introducing here is the outside world, what we can see um, as an ear. And that patient may present with an ear presentation. So a hurty ear, a sore ear, red hot inflamed ear, um, or actually an inner ear type symptom in terms of you know, pain, for example. That said, sometimes, the presenting location isn't the ear at all. And this more relates actually to when we go inside the ear, but particularly with children, the problem could be in the ear, but the presenting symptom might be somewhere else. So as a general rule, I think it's really useful to check ears in, in most presentations actually. So presentations of general unwellness, kind of virally type unwellness presentations, but also in kids, I would check the ears if they present with tummy pain or groin pain, um, something just a bit weird. And you're like, I'm not sure what's causing this. Check the ears because sometimes in children, they can't localize and identify where the issue is. And often it crops up in the ear. And that also includes for presentations of non-specific fever. So a, a fever being a sign of infection. So we've introduced, we've, we've got the idea that we've got an outer ear and that outer ear, that cartilage of the ear has got different anatomical names. And if I was to comment on them in my documentation, I would comment around the tragus, the lobules and the helix to make sure that that's fine. And also um, that I can't see anything behind the ear in terms of um, the mastoid. So let's now progress inside the ear and actually talk about those sections that I described. So this is an anatomical diagram and I've just put some dotted lines to compartmentalize these sections of the ear. And I've already described the external ear and I don't need my otoscope to be able to visualize that, I can just see it. But actually, if I was to go down the hole, the ear hole, um, and inside that tube down, that kind of tube inwards, down to the point of the membrane at the end, 
is the, the middle ear. And what I would want to comment on um, is something called my um, auditory meatus, that, that kind of opening hole, and whether there's anything you can see in there. So I can use my torch on a stick, um, or my otoscope as it, it's called, um, to actually visualize that middle ear. And in principle, that tube, the outside lining, should be nice and straight and not inflamed with you know, not too many lumps and bumps. And then I should be able to see right down to that tympanic membrane at the end of that middle ear channel. Now, unfortunately, ears aren't dead straight. And sometimes when you go to visualize this, you do need to slightly pull the ear to get that canal to line up so you can visualize that tympanic membrane. And actually, sometimes getting that visualization can be a little bit challenging. In children, it's even more challenging as they don't like things being stuck in their ear, particularly if they've got hurt ears. And sometimes you might have to get the parents to do a clinical hold on them so sit them on their lap, one hand over the top of their head, one hand over their arms, so they don't wiggle too much. And you need to take your opportunistic chance to get in there and have a look. So we've got the external element, and now we've got the, the middle ear. And as I've described, the bit that I'm probably going to comment on next in my documentation is around that external auditory meatus abbreviated to EAM, and you'll often see that in the notes that um, the EAM is unremarkable if you can't see anything um, in that actual passage way. So we've got that outside ear, and we've got this kind of hole into the ear with that tunnel, and now we're getting down to that tympanic membrane, that bit at the end. And the tympanic membrane is a bit like the covering on a tambourine, and that covering should be intact, and we'll talk about perforation a little bit later, and it should be nice and tight. And you should, if you put a torch down there, get a light reflex back. So imagine you shine a bright torch onto a tambourine, you'd get a kind of glimmering light back. And actually, if you lose your light reflex, um, that could be a sign that that tympanic membrane is a little bit inflamed um, or, um, or you know, it's less shiny in essence, and that could be a disease process going on in that inner ear. So we've got the external ear, stuff that we can see with our, our naked eye. We've got the inner ear via the external auditory meatus seen right down to that tympanic membrane. And we want to see what that tympanic membrane looks like. Is it its normal, lovely color with a nice reflective shine? Or has that changed? Is there pathology showing through that tympanic membrane and it may be inflamed red and loss of that, that shine. So if we've got an outer ear, that external ear, and we've got a middle ear, and we need to think about the inner ear next. So the bit beyond that tympanic membrane. And if that tympanic membrane is in situ and it's intact, there should be no travel from the outside world beyond the tympanic membrane. It's a closed, um, it's a closed door and it should be um, a closed compartment so that there, there shouldn't be anything getting through that tympanic membrane. What I will say is if the tympanic membrane is not intact, there's holes in it, then actually that opens up the risk for stuff going through it. And if you've got medicines that are autotoxic, ear toxic, you have to consider whether that tympanic membrane is intact and if whether you want to use those types of medicines. Um, particularly an eardrop format I'm referring to. Okay, so let's now talk about the, the bit on the inside. And this is where the ears get really, really interesting. So we've got um, a shell-like substance, um, what we call the cochlea, um, and we've got um, a bit of a, of a, a labyrinth, a labyrinth, a kind of bony type um, structure that goes on in, in the background. And I guess if we're balancing down the two functions of the ear, one is definitely around hearing, and that cochlear element is around um, hearing. And the other one is about your balance. Now, I just want to pause just to think about balance, because actually 
why is balance important? We no, we know why hearing is important, but why is balance important? So if you take a moment to think about proprioception, your ability to perceive the world around you, how do you work up? How do you work out how to stay upright in the world? How do you know that um, something's so far in front of you, or if you fall off a curb, you know, how do you regain your balance to keep upright without falling on your backside um, and you know going, going all over the place? And from an evolutionary point of view, if a saber-toothed tiger chased you um, and you had to dive out the way and then be able to get up and run, um, how would you do that in a quick, succinct fashion to in order you to survive? And actually, if we think about the proprioception, we get our information from the world around us via a few different routes. I guess our eyes, um, and think about your cranial nerves, cranial nerve two, three, four, and six, um, your optic, ocular motor, abducens, and trochlear nerves, um, they give you lots of optical information from to judge your proprioception. We also get information via our vertebral column. So as our feet hit the ground and we get vibrations up there and they travel up that vertebral column um, up to the brain. And then our third bit of information is about our um, ability to sense, are we upright? So our vestibules um, around um, telling us, you know, are we, you know, head down, head up, have we spun round, those sorts of things. So the three bits together, your ability to balance by your ears, your ability to perceive by your eyes, and your ability to sense by that vertebral column and vibrations make up your ability to proprioceptive, to balance yourself and perceive yourself um, in relation to the rest of the world. So if you start to think about maybe older people um, that have fallen over, a really common presentation for older people, you start to think about they've got disease of the, the spine and of the nerves, neuropathies, so that bit of their proprioception gets knocked out. You start to get degeneration in eyesight um, and that bit of the um, proprioception might get knocked out a little bit. And then actually we get a degeneration of this part as well, of the vis vestibule um, and the cochlea as well in terms of your hearing, you get hearing loss as you're um, potentially older and that might get knocked out. So is it a wonder that the combination of proprioception can be altered um, with disease processes of ears um, and with eyes and with um, vibration. And then actually we start to think about disease processes. So do you get any um, proprioception symptoms, as in do you start staggering or lose your balance potentially when you get presentations that affect this area? And actually you can get even as far as an ataxic gait. If you get significant infection that affects that area, um, your balance and proprioception can be really knocked off with inner ear infections. So really interesting thought about the function of the ear in relation to both our ability to hear versus our ability to balance. And I've already alluded to some of the cranial nerves for eyes and they plug straight into the brain, but also there's a cranial nerve that splits into two branches that relates to hearing and balance. And we talk about cranial nerve eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. So how do we get, first of all, the hearing sensations from the outside world, through that external auditory meatus, down to making our tympanic membrane vibrate, to this receptor and transmission device, the labyrinth and the, um, and the vestibules. But actually we've got some small little bones in there and you'll be familiar with the, the three small little bones that are commonly termed the auditory ossicles. And through the vibrations of these and through something called an oval window, this transmits into um, that um, cochlea. The cochlea is lined with fluids, a type of lymph fluid, and that will allow transmission into electrical impulses that travel to the brain and allow you to perceive that vibration as a sound. So you're not actually hearing anything. Your hearing, your hearing is a perception or an interpretation of signals. 
So if I just take a moment to talk about the fluid in there. So the fluid, the lymph, um, there's different types in there. The inside kind of lining of it is similar to inside of a cell. And then um, the outside is, is similar again. So we've got different types of um, fluidy bits inside that cochlea and um, they have different um, constituents. So different levels of potassium and sodium, for example, that allows for um, support of that transmission of sound. So I don't want to spend too long talking about the anatomy because actually you're probably more interested in the pathology. But I guess if I'm talking about clinical symptoms that present, then actually this is, this is one of the areas that can be affected. So inner ear um, is very much a common presentation. And in a moment, I'm going to talk about the little tubes, the eustachian tubes as well. So the eustachian tubes are tubes that connect the inner ear and, um, and the throat, in essence. So if we think about common viral presentations, we talk about things like sore throats, don't we? That's really common in terms of a presentation. So sore throats and sore ears commonly go together, and there is a common pathway, that eustachian tube that links the two. And we commonly see sore ears in children more than we do in adults. Um, it's a real common presentation. And for that reason, if I'm examining the ears of a child, I'll always examine the throat. And even in an adult, that extends. If they've got sore ears, always check the throat as well, because they can have that commonality um, of ears and throat um, going together. Now, in children, the eustachian tube is shorter, children are smaller, um, it's straighter, so it's got a straighter path, and it's wider. So in essence, the pathway from the site of throat infection to the ear is easier, shorter, um, straighter, wider. So that path is, um, is easier to get to. So children commonly are able to transmit that viral infection up to the ears. Balanced against adults, conversely, um, adults, the tube is longer, it's more wiggly and it's narrower. So actually, it's more difficult for viral presentations to get up there and infect the ears. So adults more commonly get the sore throat symptoms um, without the ears. It's not impossible, but less common. So it's just thinking about that presentation. Um, and I'm talking about acute infections, but you can get eustachian tube dysfunction where you commonly get ear and throat problems associated with it, um, including um, that kind of ear popping sensation or your ears are clearing. And if you think about when you travel at altitude in an aeroplane, the bits that, that pop. So let's just go about then how we, how we take the information that's come from the outside world. It's um, traveled down that external auditory meatus to the tympanic membrane. It's gone by those auditory ossicles. They've vibrated through an oval window into that lymph fluid, travels round, and we now have to get that information to the epicenter where we can interpret it. And that is via um, different branches of the cranial nerve. So we've got the two branches. We've got one that links to the vestibular, and we've got one that links um, to the cochlea, but then they plait together a bit like plaits in your hair um, to make the vestibular cochlea um, cranial nerve. So once you get that um, sound in um, or you've got that disturbance of balance or change that communicates up to the brain and then you can log it, you can perceive it and um, act accordingly. Do you perceive that lovely lullaby music that makes you um, go to sleep? Or is it the sound of the work radio that then goes, gosh, I need to get up, respond. Um, for example, is it a bleep of a cardiac monitor um, that you're going, that doesn't quite sound right. I need to, need to become alert. Is it a sudden noise that will then communicate and give you that um, neural response in terms of adrenaline and, and things like that? So our ears are complex organs but actually they're quite epic, quite amazing. And if we think about pathology that can exist, it can exist in the outer ear, in that canal, 
and actually within this inner ear. And as a general rule, the inner ear ones um, will often be more problematic than the outside ones um, and more symptomatic actually. Often we confuse and mimics um, could be toothache. So we can get dental problems that we think are ear problems. So that's on your differential diagnosis list. Um, and we can also get um, facial nerve and trigeminal nerve pain. Um, so um, if you think about your other cranial nerves, five and seven, um, we can get um, pain that mimics um, trigeminal neuralgia, for example, that we might also think is ears as well. So we've got to obviously work out where, we're, where we are with um, those presentations in terms of differentials. Is it definitely ear symptoms versus other localized pathology. I guess one of the things that patients could present with is a loss of hearing. And I'm really interested whether it's one-sided or both-sided. And we can work out whether that hearing is, you know, is it just the sound or is it the conduction in terms of the vibrations through the bones, conductive um, hearing loss. And actually, um, you know, in days old, we would have done um, interest in clinical tests, Rene's tests and Weber's tests to work that out. Nowadays, patients just go for um, auditory tests, usually via somewhere um, like Specsavers or um, another organisation that does similar type testing. But those vibrations and sounds will perceive is the problem in the outer ear? Is it in the inner ear or is it actually in that nerve location um, within um, the, the inner ear it, itself. I guess if we're talking about what could stop that, but well, actually if you've got anything that narrows the, the tube itself, um, and that could be inflammation of the walls of that, that tube, that could reduce your, your sound in. If you had um, cerumen impact, so wax that's accumulated and now, one of the worst things patients can do is stick those Q-tips, little cotton buds in their ear because the little cotton gets tied up in the wax and then, you know, it bungs up um, or they stick it in and it actually just con consolidates it, impacts it further. Um, that, can, that can cause a reduction in sound transmission. So, you know, if you've got a sound reduction, you'd want to have a look and see if, it, if it's blocked or if there is infection of that inner ear um, at the tympanic membrane, um, that can sometimes give you a muffled sound, or if that tympanic membrane is ruptured, that can actually deafen you in one ear altogether. And then the other symptom we sometimes talk about is something called tinnitus, and this kind of ringing or high-pitched noise in the ear. I'm really interested whether it's unilateral or bilateral, one ear versus the other ear, and you can get a abnormal growth called um, a neuroma, a vestibular neuroma, um, and that is ruling out and with tinnitus, unilateral tinnitus presentations. Um, and that's something the GP team will, will think about and a particular type of imaging to uh, exclude, exclude that. Um, the other thing that might muffle some sound or distort some sound is fluid. And if the ears full of gunky fluid, um, if you've got an exudative um, presentation that's, you know, blue ear, for example, um, then actually that can muffle the sound. So, Asking your patient about their hearing can be very useful, but it can be caused by different areas. So outside, middle and, and inner. So I want to talk about the, um, the actual vestibules itself. So at the top of this kind of spirally type um, conch, so it looks a bit like a shell, you can write that off as responsible for hearing. We've also got these semilunar um, kind of um, branches, if you like, at the top um, that, that look like little caves, I guess. So kind of um, they, they go round and round. Um, and we've got um, a little bit below that um, as well. So um, I don't know if you can see my, um, my mouse on screen, but kind of these substances at the top, where we've kind of got that black bit, um, above the shell, um, we've got those semi-lunar um, kind of areas and they help with particular types of balance. 
um, those semicircular canals as they're described. Um, and they're particularly good for picking up dynamic equilibrium. So, um, you know, particularly if you spin around, for example, okay. And then we've kind of got um, this vestibule. And I think about a vestibule when I describe it, if you go to a hotel, the vestibule of the hotel, that big open area. I um, mean, actually these bits underneath that semicircular canal also play a part. Um, and they're particularly um, more functional in detecting um, static equilibrium. So more, you know, your balance when you're, you're stood, stood more still. Um, and they talk about the urticle and the saccule being different parts of that lower vestibule. And actually you can go much more in depth with the anatomy and physiology of, of the inner ear. But in essence, any changes um, in this disease process around here, um, you could get a presentation of balance. What I will say and also get you to think about is although you can get sudden abnormal balances related to localized pathology, you can get that related to central pathology in terms of um, um, cerebellar presentations in terms of the, the brain. So is it a posterior stroke type presentation opposed to the ear? And you'd have to think very carefully about how much confidence you've got in your examination and ability to decide whether it's local or central, as in is it ear, is it brain, um, in terms of your diagnosis. And I would implore you to do a thorough neurological assessment and to look for other symptoms um, that may link to, um, you know, brain type presentations before allocating your diagnosis to an ear um, etiology, so an ear presentation. So just to bring that together then, in terms of um, the hair cells, those little cells within the, um, within that vestibule type area, um, and even in the, the cochlea, they have different functions, some around static equilibrium, some around dynamic or moving equilibrium. And then within the um, cochlea bit itself, you know, get your, get your sound um, up. And the two elements of that vestibular cochlea um, nerve, that cranial nerve eight, is the vestibular branch for the vestibule and the cochlear branch um, for the hearing bit and um, for the cochlea. Okay, so I've given you a bit of insight into the anatomy. Um, and when we talk about pathology, it's really useful to think about that in relation to, um, in relation to the anatomy that's underpinning. Because if you've got a thorough awareness of your anatomy, then actually that can inform your understanding of your disease process. So I'm going to now talk about some of the pathologies that we commonly see um, in um, particularly general practice primary care. And some of them, uh, you know, common as anything, and then some of them are more rare. Um, and the more rare ones usually relate to congenital abnormalities. So they're, you, you know, you don't see kind of abnormal or strange ears on the majority of people. Now, what I will say before we move on to talk about those pathologies is actually you have two ears or the majority of people have two ears and that gives you a great opportunity um, to um, examine both. And you can compare left to right um, just to see whether actually is it a, an, an odd presentation for them, um, but both ears are the same. So actually it's, it's just them being a bit, a bit odd. Um, or is there actual one-sided pathology going on? Because actually, you know, if you were talking about growth, for example, you'd unlikely get a growth in the left and a growth in the right in exactly the same way. Um, so it's that differentiation between what's normal for them versus what is a, a, a new pathology. So there's seven broad things that we, we see um, in, in the outer ear. Um, and complications of the outer ear can lead to hearing loss because the outer ear allows you to um, support your hearing. You know, it allows you to, to focus it. Otherwise, what's the point of having ears opposed to just holes on the side of your head? And as I've said, anything along that pathway could potentially affect your hearing. 
So the ones that I think about, um, if I get a patient coming to me with hearing loss, I think about earwax all day long, earwax first. And I know a few people that have referred, you know, straight for consultant review, for example, because of hearing loss. And actually, have they done the most simplest of assessments and thought about, um, thought about earwax? Now, I want you to think about a candle. So if you were to have a candle at home, a candle's made of wax. If you were to put water on the top of a candle, it generally just sits there. It doesn't really absorb through, through the wax. And it, it's the same, really. So, um, you know, you, you rarely can get wax to absorb water. Um, but some of the treatments that we do use often involve oily type substance um, because wax would tend to absorb that more um, than it would with water. So if we just think about some of the treatments, some of the over the counter recommendations, it may include treatment such as, um, for example, olive oil. Um, other treatments for um, earwax um, are, are out there, including microsuction um, and um, syringe. Um, what I will say is we say the word syringe and what I've known patients to do is go home, get a syringe and jet wash their ears. And what they end up doing is perforating their tympanic membrane. So actually, we don't want them to do that. When we say syringe, it's more a gentle floating out than it is a jet wash um, because of your the risk of that barrier trauma of, of the ear if they do it too much. We talk about foreign body occlusions. So um, kids particularly put stuff in their ears. And sometimes the first thing you know about it is actually a smelly ear. Um, sometimes it discharges. And um, when you have a look, you can sometimes see something in there. And I'll show you some pictures about stuff that's in the ear um, in just a few moments time. So that is a consideration. And if you're thinking about treatment, it's how do you get it out? And sometimes the best approaches are to float it out, providing the tympanic membranes in, intact. Um, and occasionally you can um, either use a, a suction type thing or um, you, know, you could potentially under visualization um, take it out, but you have to be really careful around perforation because you don't want to damage um, that, that delicate ear, eardrum. You get lumps and bumps grow in these exotoses or exotosis, um, and usually they're, they're, they're quite benign in the ear, but you can still get um, skin cancers within the ear, so you, you do have to be cautious there, same as you can get um, melanomas, for example, and squamous cell carcinomas in any part of the body, you can get them in the ear. Um, I've talked about otitis externa, but I'll show you some pictures of that around actual outside skin infection. And we've also got a few things you can be born with. So kind of small ears or ears that don't quite grow. Um, I'm not gonna show you pictures of those, but for awareness, um, you know, that doesn't suddenly happen. They don't have big ears one day and small ears the next. This is a congenital presentation um, that they'll be born with and have for, for, for many years. But obviously that can lead to hearing, hearing problems. So let's take the case that you've got a patient that's presented to you with, I don't know, a bit of hurty ear, maybe some non-specific fevers or chills. Um, and you think, OK, it's, it's reasonable to have a look in their ear um, to do an examination. So we're going to have an otoscope or an oroscope. We're going to have a look in the ear. We're going to gently um, have a look. But before I do, I'm going to make sure I do my external ear examination of my tragus, my pinea, my helix. I'm going to have a look behind the ear to make sure that bone doesn't look bruised, sore, infected, and my patient's not too toxic. Think about that brain infection that can progress from that. And if I'm happy, I'm going to have a, a look inside the actual ear. And I might need to gently tug on the ear to bring that canal into alignment. If it's a small child, I may have to have parents clinically holding them um, to um, get, a, get a view. And I'm going to pop my little um, speculum in, which is the um, kind of plastic device, which allows you to look into ears and have it have a look. Now, what I will say is you don't need to jam that speculum right into the ear. And actually, if you've ever had that done, it's really horrible and really tender. You only need to pop the tip of the speculum just inside the ear, enable you to gain a view. And actually, you don't need to go hardly deep at all. 
and patients will thank you um, if you don't hurt them. Because if you progress too much, even if they've got a normal healthy ear, it will still hurt if you push that speculum in too far. And if you think about the care of your patient in the long run, next time that they come to have an ear examination, for their next presentation, they're going to have that health anxiety. So think about your care of patients long, long term. And if it's not you, it's the next person that, that comes to them. They're, you'll often see children rec um, you know, recall in fear that they're going to have their ears hurt through an ear examination. So let's put up a picture of a normal ear. So if I was to look down a normal ear, what sort of things would I see? Well, broadly, this is round. It's not perfectly round, but it's broadly. And remember what I said about that tambourine. So a bit like a tight covering on a drum. And if I shined a torch down, I should get a light reflex. Um, and if I was to put a clock around, um, I guess five o'clock on the clock here, um, you can see that light reflex. So that is a sign of a healthy ear. You can see a small, few small blood vessels, but overall it seems almost quite transparent. You can't see any fluid behind the ears, no blood behind um, that tympanic membrane. Um, this looks relatively healthy. And the other thing to comment on is that um, it's, it's intact. Conversely, if it's full of wax, um, you can visualize that and you can see um, this particular um, one is full of wax and you'd have to soften that wax and um, have that wax floated out, potentially. In this one, they might have a buzzing sensation. <laughs> um, so um, you can see here, it's got a foreign body, but in this case, it's an insect and floating out is often the best way with insects because you can't usually get hold of them because they break up when you, when you get hold of them. In this one, we've got a small ball, and actually you can see this otitis externa, this infection of the wall that's got gone around this foreign object, and you might have a smelly presentation um, with, with this one. This one I would treat with antibiotics um, as well, otitis externa normally treat with antibiotics. And here's another form of otitis externa. Um, and in this one, you can see the tragus is inflamed. Um, you've got some gunk in the ear as well. Um, and you know, you've got some lumpy bits. And if I was to look down, you can see that lumpiness all the way down. You can see why this would impact with hearing narrowed canal and lumpy bumpy bits, fluid in there um, as well. Um, again, treat with um, treat with um, antibiotics for this one. Occasionally we see trauma. Um, I'm not going to say too much about trauma, but um, the two main traumas we see are you know, actual rips in the ear um, and they don't heal well. So they need really good um, bringing together. So we need to get that um, intention, um, that primary intention back to, together um, and usually requires um, suturing to get that and careful monitoring. They, they don't have a good blood supply. They don't heal well. And the other one we see is cauliflower ear where you would get this hematoma between the layers um, and actually this will need drainage. Um, again, this does not heal well. This is a common one from rugby injuries um, normally. So I've just got um, a couple more just to talk about before we um, finish up the talk and we'll take some more questions. Um, but the main one that you know is really common to general practice particularly is a titus media, characterized um, by that redness of the tympanic membrane, often very painful um, and usually viral in presentation. The people that we would treat with antibiotics are people with severe systemic infection. So that, you know, fluid-like symptoms of fever, just generally um, unwell in themselves rather than localized ear problems. Um, particular um, people with um, complications of acute otitis media. So um, meningitis I've described, mastoiditis I've described, um, sinus thrombosis, facial nerve paralysis, um, so anything that's presenting other than the ear. And then the, um, the NICE guidelines say that actually children younger than three months of age with a temperature of 38 degrees or more um, should, should, be, um, should be treated. Um, and children three to six months of age with a temperature over 39 or more should be um, treated. And generally treatment wise, um, if we were to treat it, 
uh, we would treat normally between three and five days for a titus media if we were going to treat treat for it but actually antibiotics don't um, sort out the pain and you need regular analgesia um, for that sometimes you get um, fluid with this it gets um, exudative and bilateral exudative is a normally another reason to treat and if people get reoccurring exudative processes sometimes the surgeons put in um, grommets to um, help drain at ENT surgeons. And the final one I just want to talk about is perforation and sometimes we see this from barotrauma and um, pressure trauma and here you can see the tympanic membrane has ruptured and you'll have got complete hearing loss um, with this where, it, where it's ruptured. As a general rule, if it's not touch, a little one touching the side often is um, you know, problematic. Um, and sometimes you get little holes that will heal up within, within about 14 days, but big holes and ones touching the side, um, I, I, I do worry about it as well. So um, tympanic um, membrane ruptures are associated with hearing, hearing loss. And then the final one on my list um, is just blood behind it. So for those of you that work in trauma situations, um, basal skull fractures, for example, can present with um, blood behind the tympanic membrane. Um, and you may want to look in ears um, as part of a trauma assessment. So just a move away from, um, from primary care. So to bring this all together then and to close up, um, you can get disease processes at the outer ear, within the middle ear, and within that inner ear. And um, you've got to think really carefully about, is it localized in terms of ear? Is it a mimic in terms of other things, dental, um, nerve type issues, um, or central brain type, type problems as your differential? Because broadly, ear things you know, can be problematic, but often not too sinister, um, but brain things um, can be um, much worse. And I think given the time, I'm going to um, stop there, if that's OK, and then just open this up um, for questions. <laughs>